Hello brothers and sisters of Christ. If you haven't watched the intro, please watch the intro first to our Bible man hunts. Okay, this is part one. So if you listen to the so-called rhyme, when you find books like this, which I showed in the intro, when you come across books like this and they say things, we need to have the attitude, this whole thing, I'll just reiterate it again, is all about learning to study for yourself. What say the scriptures? Is what they're saying right? Or what they're saying kind of not right on. Okay, So hopefully you listen to the first poem and uh, we're going to go through it. Okay, How many of you guessed that it's talking about Queen... Oh, gosh, I didn't even put the name up there. Sheba. I'm talking about Queen Sheba and Solomon. But the, the manhunt is it's, it's Sheba. Queen Sheba. How many of you guessed that? How many of you did Sword Searcher and looked it up? Okay. So we're going to break it down together and actually go through the scriptures and see if it was an accurate telling or if it was false, you know. Because once again, when someone tells you something, oh, this represents this person, or you should do this, a good Christian will do this, or that. It's all about what saith the scriptures. Okay, so this whole series is just about we're going to just dive into these poems and we're going to try to figure out who it is and did we figure out who it is by the scriptures or was some of it kind of off? You know, not quite right. So, let's get to this one, the Riddler. Now, first thing is, I wouldn't use the word the Riddler, but we'll get into it. Okay? Let's read the first part. I came to riddle the Riddler to see if the Riddler would. By wisdom or wit, unriddle for me the riddles, or if he could. Now, the Riddler is supposed to equal King Solomon. Okay? King Solomon wrote Proverbs. Okay? At first I was like, the word riddle isn't even in the Bible. Actually it is in the Bible. So like I said, there's times where you jump the guns and you say to yourself, it's not there. You do the study. And all this whole teaching, like I said, is to motivate you brothers and sisters, I pray you did the study before we're doing this together, that you did a little bit of a study on your own and tried to look up who is this person, does the riddle line up with the Bible, so we can figure out who this person is. Okay. So, uh, King, the riddler is supposed to equal King Solomon, when it says, I came to riddle the riddler. Okay. But he did Proverbs. What's a proverb? Remember Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Proverb, in scripture, and sometimes signifies a moral sentence or maximum that is <laughs> eglamatical, I can't even pronounce that word, eggmatical, a dark saying of the wise that requires interpretation. Okay, and an example of that is turn to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5. Make sure you have your King James Bibles out. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5. Okay. King James Bible. <laughs> Proverbs 1, 5. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. Verse 6, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the word of the wise, and their dark sayings. Okay, a proverb increases your learning and understanding. It has to do with, that's what I talk about morals, moral values, talk about the ways of the world, how things are going to happen, why things are happening, um, you know, the do's, the don'ts. Okay, that's a proverb. Okay, what's a riddle? Well, the, 18, the 1828 Webster's Dictionary talks about a riddle being an enigma. Something proposed for conjecture or that is to be solved, solved by conjecture. A puzzling question, ambiguous proposition. And I kind of broke it down, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I broke it down, I'll say it again later, but a riddle has an answer where a proverb has a lesson to learn. There's something for understanding, for wisdom. A riddle, there's just an answer. Okay? But what's a good example of that? Turn to Judges chapter 14, verse 12. Remember, you can always pause the video and turn there. But I want to keep these videos from being two hours long, even though sometimes they still wind up being two hours long sometimes. Okay? But turn to Judges chapter 14, 12. I actually looked in the Bible and said, man, the riddle's not in the Bible. I never, I don't remember riddle being in the Bible, the word riddle. How many of you, when you listen to that, how many remember the word riddle? Some of you probably did. I should have. I've read the Old Testament several times. But for some reason, it just passed me. So I, I type in riddle for the word uh, sword searcher, and it came up. 
primarily used by one man. Okay. One section, and Judges 14 is all the mentions of Riddle, and then Riddle will be mentioned one more time in another area of the Bible. But Judges 14, 12, we're going to talk about Samson. And Samson said unto them, I will put forth a riddle unto you. If you can certainly de declare it to me within the seven days of the feast, and I find it out, then I will give you thirty sheets and thirty change of raiments. But if you cannot declare it to me, then shall ye give me thirty sheets and thirty changes of garments. And they said unto him, Put forth thy riddle, and we may hear it, that we may hear it. And he said unto them, Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And they could not in three days expound the riddle. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband, and he may declare unto us the riddle. So we're seeing the word riddle a lot through here. Lest we burn thee in thy father's house with fire, have ye called us to take that we have? Is it not so? And Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou dost but hate me and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto my, the children of my people and hast not told it to me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it unto my father nor my mother. And shall I tell it thee? Now question, remember the riddle was, because I'm going back up there, make sure I didn't admit, skip it, but it says, but if you can declare it to me, let's see, out of the, he says, and it said unto them, out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. That's the riddle. We keep seeing the riddle over and over. It says, out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. That's the riddle. Verse 17, And she wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted. And it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her, because she lay sore upon him, and she told the riddle, and she told the riddle to the children of the people. She gave him the answer. In other words, like I said, a riddle is something you put forth that has an answer. So she got the answer from Samson and then gave it to her people. Verse 18, And the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey? Honey was one of the answers. And what is stronger than a lion? Lion was the second part of the answer. So it was a two-part answer. Honey and lion. And he said unto them, If ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon, and slew thirty men of them, and took their spoil, and gave change of raiment unto them, which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. But here's where you see all the mentions of riddle, and it's only mentioned one other time. But you see the example. The Bible often defines itself. A riddle is something that's put forth, some kind of a question, some kind of form that's put forth, that there's an answer. Okay. Now, this the answer of honey and lion, did it expound on how to live your life and moral values? And it, no, it was just a riddle. That's what a riddle is. Just something that has an answer. Okay. If you turn, to, you don't have to, but if you turn to Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 2, that's where you read the last time that riddle is used. It says, Son of man, this is God talking to a prophet. Son of man, put forth a riddle and speak a parable unto the house of Israel. And speak a parable. So when you actually look into that, when he's speaking his parables, there's certain sections in there where it's an actual riddle, where there's an answer. Talking about um, Nebuchadnezzar. You know, the whole thing about Nebuchadnezzar is the one that's going to come in and take, take the Jewish people because they're just, they've turned their back on God. Okay? So some parts of that parable are not parables that's a riddle that has an answer. All right. Some of it's parables to try to teach them. Turn back to God. Who knows the mercy of God? He might repent. You know, but they wouldn't. They refuse to. But the point is, is it shows that the riddle and speak a parable are separate. They're two different things. Now where is riddle mentioned at all with Solomon? It's not mentioned at all. Proverbs. 
He gave Proverbs. He wrote Proverbs. Absolutely. But Riddle? Would I have called, said, would I have titled this The Riddler? No, I probably titled this The Answer Man. She came to her with all kinds of riddles, proverbs, questions, which were, I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, and he could answer them. He's the answer man. He, he had such wisdom. But where did he get this wisdom? Where does the Bible say he got that wisdom? I have to point that out because it's not in that riddle at all. It's like we need to give God glory in all things. Give him thanks in all things. But we need to give glory to God. We need to give credit where credit is due. Where did Solomon get all that wisdom? Turn to 1 Kings 3.5. Step back a little bit. <laughs> I was like, get a little close to the camera. Um, 1 Kings 3 5. And Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God asked, or God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walketh before thee in truth and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness. Thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king, made thy servant king, instead of David thy father. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which is thou hast chosen a great people, that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this so this thy so great a people? And the speech please the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment, behold, I have done according to thy word. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart. Now, it doesn't say this, but usually it's the Holy Spirit. King David had the Holy Spirit. Okay. Wisdom, we give God glory in all things. In our life today, brothers and sisters Christ, when I do something right, I give God glory. He showed me that that's the right way to do it, and I'm doing something right. If I do something wrong, that's on me. But the whole point is, is it's usually the Holy Spirit that comes in, that gives us the wisdom. In the Old Testament, the men with wisdom, great wisdom, were men that had the Holy Spirit. So that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall be not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy, thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways, that's always dependent on, are you following the Lord Jesus Christ? All right? Are you following God, which Jesus Christ is God? And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream, and he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. Where did, I'd say the answer man, but they say Riddler, where did he get his wisdom? His ability, where did Solomon get his ability to answer everybody's questions? Where they put forth a riddle, a proverb, hit them up with questions? That wisdom comes from God. Okay, God gave it to him. That's important to remember. But you turn to 1 Kings 10.1, this really gives us the answer. Okay, of who this manhunt is for this, for this part one. Okay, it's Queen Sheba. Because you turn to 1 Kings 10.1, we read, And when Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. Now once again, it doesn't use the word riddle. It says hard questions. Now can certain questions be riddles? 
Yeah. Can certain questions be Proverbs? Yeah. Can certain questions just be like life? Like stuff in her life that she was having trouble with or something. And she couldn't find an answer, couldn't solve it or something. And she came to Solomon and he had all the answers. Okay, it says hard questions. Right. So, like I said, I title this the answer man. <laughs> Not the Riddler, the answer man. Because he had the answers. Okay, regardless of whether it was a riddle, proverb, or a question about life, he had the answers. Let's get back to the poem. So that was the first part, the first part of the poem. Okay? This is where you learn, okay, it's Sheba, but let's keep going to find out more about this. The Riddler could and would and did unriddle them great and small. And so I gave to him the prize, gold, gems, and spices, all. What does the Bible say about this? Okay. Turn to 1 Kings, actually if you're still in 1 Kings 10.1, we're just going to jump down to 1 Kings 10.3. We're going to be jumping around a little bit to answer these questions in the poem. Okay. 1 Kings 10.3, and Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all of Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built and the meat of his table and the sitting of his servants and the attendance of his ministers and their apparel and his cupbearer and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in my own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. So she gave him credit. Give the Lord credit. That's what we did earlier. We showed that it was the Lord that gave him that wisdom. Remember Joseph? I'm just, just going on a side note. But you remember Joseph when it came to Pharaoh? I heard that you have this power and this great wisdom to discern dreams. I have no power of my own. Doesn't interpretations belong to God? Joseph gave God the credit. Gave God the glory. Okay, verse 7. Howbeit I believe not the words until I came... And my, my, let's see, and my eyes have seen it, and behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. Happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee, and that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighteth in thee, to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loveth Loved Israel forever, therefore made he the king to do justice, judgment and justice. Verse 10. And she gave the king a hundred and twenty talents of gold, and spices very great stores, and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. So does that line up with the Bible? It says, I gave him a prize, gold, gem, and spice of all. Yes. Um, he could have riddled things both great and small. It talks about how he answered all her questions. Until she had no spirit. The spirit was not left in her. In other words, she had nothing else to say. There was nothing else to ask. He answered everything. He kept nothing from her. So that part, like I said, the only part I've, I've, I'm kind of disagreeing with this poem is the fact that it's titled Riddle, Riddler, and it's calling Solomon a Riddler. Okay. There's more than just riddles. He's an answer man. He's answering all her questions. He put all her questions to her. Let, he couldn't keep anything from her. Yeah. Next part of the poem says, I traveled far by train, not car, to verify the word. Now the word that, that's talked about here, we already read part of it because I'm not going to go back to it. The fame, the word that's coming to her that there's this great man over here. His name is Solomon. He's a great king and he's got all these riches and he's just so wise. He can answer anything. She heard this word of him. Okay. And she traveled by train, not by car. Something i got to point out is that back in the past, uh, we didn't, it's not like today. You get in a car, it would probably take me four, I'm guessing four days to travel to Medford where I used to live and have family and back here to Brookings if I was on foot. Horseback, I could probably get there a lot faster, probably a couple days. Four days walking, two days on horseback, maybe. You know, but... 
with a car and get there in two and a half hours. We don't understand that back in the past, it took a long time to travel from place to place. It took many days. Okay. So she traveled by tra traveled far by train. Uh, you're still in 1 Kings 10. Go back to verse 2. 1 Kings 10, uh, verse 2. We read, and she came to Jerusalem with a very great train. What does that mean by train? Is that it had a lot of people with her. She didn't just walk by herself, come walk in. It's a train. Almost reminds me of the wise men. When they came into the city, it was so known, there was a group, huge group of them. It's like a train. That's what it means by train. There's a lot of people. Okay. With camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. So is that in the Bible? Yes. And it's talking about who came to Jerusalem with the great train? She came. Queen Sheba. Now, here's the point. This is a big one. The last part of the poem. That kind of threw me for a loop. The last part of the poem is like, eh. the last part of the poem said, I had no thought of damning aught, but will someday, I'm oh, sorry, yeah. I've traveled far by train, not car, to verify the word. I have no thought of damning aught, but will someday you've heard. I'm just doing the rhyme. <laughs> but that last part, I had not thought of damning aught, but will someday you've heard. Now when we read this and look into it, it's not actually talking about her specifically. It's what she represents. Turn to Matthew chapter 12, verse 42. Matthew 12, verse 42. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, with Jesus speaking, and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. If you turn to Luke chapter 11, verse 31, it retells the story again. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. It's Jesus Christ speaking. Okay? So what's the point of this? It's mentioned in there, yeah. So they put it in the poem, so it mentioned it, so they put it in the poem to have to refer to Sheba, Queen Sheba. But actually what he's referring to is, yeah, you have Queen Sheba is what she represents. The Egyptian Empire, the false religion, going all the way back to... See if I can get that in there. The Babylonian religion. You say, oh, how does that have to do with anything? This is a good book, don't get me wrong. Like I said, I can't really support uh, Chick Publications' present tense, but I have this book called uh, Babylon Religion, How a Babylonian Goddess Became the Virgin Mary. Okay, and you watch the transition. He talks about that in here. Okay, it starts with uh, Babylon. You have the pagan, the, where the Trinity truly came from, the pagan Trinity. Let's see if I can remember. Nimrod, Samaramis, and Tammuz. That's the pagan Trinity. Nimrod's not Tammuz, Tammuz is not Samaramis, Samaramis is not Nimrod, but they are gods. They're all gods. That's where the pagan trinity comes from. It started in Babylon. Then you read in the Bible about the Tower of Babel, spread them all out. I'm just doing a little bit of summary of the book. Spread them all out, and then the religion went over and became the Egyptian religion. You have Horus, Set, and I forgot the third one. I always forget the third one. But you have the pagan trinity transformed, and it's still there. That Babylonian religion is still there under the Egyptians. Okay? That's where you got Queen of Sheba. It's there. Then, as it goes on, it shows how it transformed into the Roman Empire. They had the pagan religion. And today it's, it's, under, it's under the Catholic, Catholicism, the Catholic Church. The Babylonian religion has made it to the Catholic Church. Their Mary is actually Samaramis. Their Jesus is Tammuz, God the Father, which is an old man with a beard, <laughs> the separate person, is Nimrod. Okay, it's that same three people. There are gods, plural. That's the pagan Trinity. Okay? And I could go into it big time, brothers and sisters of Christ. The reason we don't stand for the Trinity is because it's not in the Bible. 
The Bible teaches the Godhead. The Bible teaches that there's only one person in the Godhead. It's Jesus Christ. There's only one capital G God, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, the Father. So God the Father is the only correct term. There is no God the Son. There is no God the Holy Spirit. God is a capital S Spirit, but it's not God the Spirit. There's not three gods that make up one big God. The Bible teaches there's only one capital G, God the Father. Then you have the Son of God the Father. Of. There's connection. Jesus can have the, hold the title of God because he's connected to God the Father. They are one. I and the fa my Father are one. Okay. Then you have the Spirit of God the Father. Capital S Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Connected to God the Father. That's the of part. Uh, we've already talked about these studies. I don't want to go into it big time, but the point is, is you have that Babylonian false system coming through all the way up to the Catholic Church, but at the time that Jesus was speaking this, who was in charge of the, of the Jews, who was dominating over the Jews? The Roman Empire. And they're greater, it says here, a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God manifests in the flesh, the likeness of sinful flesh. God in the flesh is standing right there talking to you. God the Father is talking to you every time Jesus opens his mouth. It's God the Father speaking. Body, soul, and spirit. But the point is, is he's saying, I'm here to bring in the thousand year reign. To be your king. To get you out from underneath these people. But he said, um, the, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. They rejected Jesus Christ. They rejected him. So the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ got put off. What happened? The Roman Empire judged him. Uh, what was it, 60 or 70 AD they destroyed the temple? Not one stone shall stand on this temple. So there's a lot more to that than just think, trying to use it as a reference to Queen Sheba. Okay? Just wanted to throw that in there. So, um, well, I'll get, I'll get the second poem going here in a few seconds. But like I said, it's a good book about the transition. So overall, this poem, when we got it out of this book, I'll go ahead and pick up the book again, does it really line up with Scripture? Remember the whole point of the study is to get you to start getting into the Bible yourselves and learning how to study the Bible for yourselves. Get that sword searcher if you have to. But like I said, so far, almost everything lined up with the Bible to a point, to kind of try to point you to that person, Queen Sheba. But the only thing I disagree with is calling him the Riddler. You know, like I said, I've, I've said he's the answer man. Okay, there's more to it than just riddles. Riddles wasn't the only thing he answered. Okay, and he didn't put forth with riddles. He answered all her questions. He, she put forth hard questions. He was the one doing all the answering. Okay. And he did create Proverbs. Don't get me wrong. But that's pretty much the only thing. But like I said, as we get through to some of the others, there's some of them that I'm like, I don't remember that. What's that there? And sometimes it's me. Like I said with the word riddle, sometimes it's me. I don't remember stuff. So you have to stay in this book so you can remember stuff. So remember the exercise. Learn, learn, learn. Learn to use this book and read this book. And remember, this is our final authority. Someone comes along with a poem and says, such and such, such and such. Well, what does the Bible say? That's the whole point of this manhunt. Okay? Is to get you guys back into studying the Bible for yourselves and looking things up to see if these things are so. Be like the Bereans, okay, who search the scriptures night and day to see if those things are so. That's the whole point of this. There's a lot of people coming out that are saying this or saying that. What saith the scriptures? So, we'll get into the next poem. And we'll see if you guys can figure out who it is. And before we get into the study next week, we're only going to do these once a week. So, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and stay tuned and listen to the next poem. Second poem for the manhunt, titled, A Successful Failure. My name lent fame to a city small. My strategy captured a fortress tall. You'll find I'm a patriarch, author, and seer. And a player or fighter, I've never appear. My weapon, the greatest in Israel's band, 
was not made for me, it was mine second hand. My spouses were many, my children brought grief, to me and my people for one li life was brief. For purpose detect deceptive, I doodled and drooled, men thought me a traitor, but I kept them fooled. Three sins I committed against the Lord God, and thrice felt the wrath of his chastening rod. In faithful obedience I've seldom an equal, and latter-day writ you may read of my sequel. My greatest ambition I failed to fulfill, yet I'm a success, I'll be honored until. The earth is no more, so great is my fame. Now with all of these clues, can you guess my name? <laughs>